We are back to the original uh, number of three questions, uh, but I just would like to make uh, a small remark. Please, no applause. Mr. Didat doesn't need it. And I know it is a spontaneous expression on your part, but still try to control yourselves with applause. Thank you. I thank you for your previous answer, which I will meditate. Uh, now my second question is of, um, I would say, an ethical nature. It's connected with the previous one. Uh, in the meantime, before the uh, end of history, which we talked about before, we live in history, and we have to deal with um, human defects or sins, which are very old, such as uh, selfishness or deceit. And we see, in, uh, in particular, in the present stage of history, which we live in, some problems which are typical of our times, uh, problems of the difference of uh, income between men and nations, problems of the... To take an example, today all over the, news, <coughs> the press <coughs> and the TV, I suppose, in Geneva and probably much of the world, you have this story, the event of the decrease of the price of coffee. Uh, <clears throat> the consequences of phenomena of that kind, we know. Those uh, pe millions of people who are very poor will see their income decrease. And uh, while those who are richer will, won't, uh, won't uh, have uh, lesser income. And we have problems, uh, well this is an example, we have problems like this we see very often, especially in the city uh, where we live, we see the problem of the treatment of um, foreigners, of uh, strangers, and um, expulsion of uh, people of certain nationalities and so on. And we, we see those problems of that kind every day, those kinds every day in the newspapers. And uh, my question is, you gave us before examples of uh, practical wisdom of Islam and of the Quran, in, especially in matters of matrimony, uh, divorce and uh, remarriage. Uh, my question is, um, do we find in the Holy Quran or in Islamic theology uh, teachings of uh, practical wisdom uh, to face the, those problems which are typical of the world in which we live in this generation. Could you give us a few examples? Give me something specific to work upon. The price of specific coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make another lecture on economy. All right. <laughs> that is a danger. Uh, maybe I'm going to specify my question a little bit. One of the examples I took was the price of coffee. It so happens that in Christian theology, uh, in the theology of the Middle Ages, and I'm going to take the example of Thomas Aquinas, you have long dissertations about the fixing of just prices. And in the, in the uh, European Middle Ages, that had a certain reality. Uh, the prices of bread and so on were fixed according to certain uh, ethical norms. But it seems that it's much more absent in the, it's much more absent in the 20th century, especially in the relationships between, uh, between nations, rich nations and poor nations. For instance, in the matter which I mentioned before, probably one will be able to read uh, dozens of newspapers articles about uh, the decrease of the price of coffee and its uh, sad consequences, but probably without any ethical or theological reference. Whereas uh, Christian theology actually is full of those uh, references, but they are just not quoted. They are just not quoted. So my question, maybe I will repeat it in a way that's, 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 that's less clear now. Could you give us maybe one or two examples of um, the practical uh, wisdom of uh, the Holy Quran and possibly Islamic theology facing problems which are typical of the days in which we live. Thank you very much. You see, I am not an economist, nor am I a theologian. I am a person who has been talking, talking about religion, I have become a talker, a lecturer. 
in comparative religion. But I might, you know, hazard a guess in telling that, look, the Islamic system, you see, it gives us certain basic rules on which to fix prices. For example, say the end, at the end of the month of fasting, Ramadan, we give a certain charity called fitra. That is the term that's applied, fitra. And this fitra, we calculate, I think, certain weight of wheat. Is it? Can anybody give it to me? Mm. What, what, what weight is that? Seven francs. Right. No, no, that's not in money, in, 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 in weight of wheat. Two and a half. Right. So two and a half kilo of wheat. So whatever the price ruling at the time, suppose you, you don't have to go and look for wheat, because the man might not need wheat, he might need rice. He prefers rice to wheat. But we take the value of that wheat, two and a half kilo, and give it to the poor. So a price is fixed. Whether now that wheat is 50 francs, two and a half kilo, or whether it is five francs, or whether it is 500 francs, whatever the price goes up, that is the compulsory charity each and every Muslim must give at the end of the month of fasting. So here it is. And in the early Muslim empire, if you had a bag of wheat in Timbuktu, and you left that bag of wheat there, you said, look, you can sell, and you, can, you have a, uh, your business in China, I will get a bag of wheat there. That's how it worked. And the same thing was suggested, I think, by Iran to the West. He says, look, let us fix the price of oil. On the basis, this, let's come to a, a, an agreement. Oil today, what is it worth? Yes, it's thirty dollars, twenty dollars, whatever it is. How many loaves of bread can we buy in, in Germany for that? Now that's fixed now. How many loaves can we buy in England? How many loaves can we get for that twenty dollars today? How many can we get in Geneva for that twenty dollars? So that, that is fixed. So if your price of bread goes up, the price of my oil goes up, in keeping with that. But now it doesn't suit the West. You see, they're playing games. How they can, you know, drop this fellow by, you know, these cartels and what and what not. Now this is for the economists, you know, to deal with. But this is the simple principle laid down by Islam. And it is more practical than Thomas Aquinas, you know, all this dissertation that he has written, which nowhere is the first time in my life. I'm 70 year old, I hear about Aquinas having written it. No Christian worth the name has ever spoken about it in 70 years of my living. This is how good it is. You know, Aquinas. These are the only scholars in the universities they know about Aquinas and what he did and what he said, but no Christian knows about it either. Sadly so. Azubillah ameni shaitan rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim There's something which is beating my mind. And uh, is that the Bible uh, is used by Christians. And this very book has given birth to so many churches. And uh, I remember when I was, I was a Christian before, I was a presbyter because my parents are uh, like that. And uh, later I deserted and then joined Jehovah's Witness. Now what we used to do is that we take the Bible, go back to my colleagues uh, who, who are presbyters, then we use the same Bible to prove them wrong, that their principles are wrong. And, uh, and so, but I can see that uh, Brother D that uh, uh, spent much of his time on the Bible. And uh, I don't know if you advised me to, to do the same thing. Uh, because I feel that my common sense tells me that if the Bible, like uh, the Holy Quran, all Muslims, any time they are about to pray, at least everybody have to say, uh, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Uh